Um, today we are going to talk about pelvic inflammatory disease. There actually isn't very much, um, the, I don't think this lecture is going to be very, very long. So if you have any questions, just keep them for the end and we can go through them then. Or if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat and I'll keep, um, keep an eye out for you. Okay, so does anyone know what pelvic inflammatory disease is? What are we talking about when we say pelvic inflammatory disease? Anybody? Yeah, go on. Nashma, go on. Uh, hello, madam. Um, um, pelvic inflammatory disease is an uh, acute infection in upper genital uh, tract, and uh, maybe there include their uterus, fallopian tube, and ovarian there at the end. And uh, a patient that has uh, a pelvic inflammatory disease, they have uh, some of symptoms like lower abdominal pain, uh, cervical mutation, tenderness, and uh, I don't know. Perfect. You've just done the whole lecture in two, two sentences. So that's, actually, that's correct. So it's an inflammation or um, inflammation or infection in the pelvis area. And when we think about the pelvis in a woman, most organs that sit in the pelvis are your um, reproductive systems. Um, and when we think about infection in that pelvic area, what are the ways that someone can get an infection in the pelvic area? Can anyone throw some ideas? Where does infection start for it to go into the pelvis? vagina correct so it's usually an, an, an infection that started in the vagina that then because there is the cervix and there's an opening from the cervix that goes into the uterus and therefore goes into the fallopian tubes and um, that's how it spreads but um, so PID is an infectious and an inflammatory disorder of the upper female genital tract as Nedra said earlier um, going back to your anatomy so we're not going to do much of anatomy today but what you want, can you see my mouse at all? Can you see my mouse moving? Yes, perfect, okay. So this is the vagina here. Um, it's mostly um, sexually transmitted infections that will go and cause CID, so pelvic inflammatory disease. So someone will have intercourse, uh, will get a bacteria, most commonly either uh, gonorrhea or chlamydia, Gonorrhea or chlamydia will go and usually sit around here or sit around in the vagina, causes a bit of infection. If it's not treated, what happens is it goes up, it goes higher up into the, into the uterus. When it goes into the uterus, it can cause an inflammation of this lining of the endometrium. So we usually then call that endometritis so because it's an inflammation of the endometrium. If it further spreads out, it goes into the fallopian tubes and it can go one side, it can go both sides. And the word that we use when it causes inflammation of the fallopian tubes is usually salpingitis. That's just the Latin word for it. Um, and then if it continues, it can go to the ovaries and um, can cause what we then call ulceritis. Again, inflammation of the ovaries, just fancy names to say um, inflammation of those organs. And when you think about the pelvis, everything is quite um, attached to each other, if that makes sense, and it's open. Everything is very open in the female reproductive system. So the cervix firstly is open, can allow things to go in. Uh, but then even the fallopian tube, so the fallopian tube with the embryo is just sort of sits there, and the ovary is just hanging. The ovary is hanging in open air with the ligaments holding onto it. So nothing is really perfect. Oh, remember, uh, infection that's your voice around. is not mm. clear to the student. Uh, please, uh, if you use Can you hear me better now? Yes, yes. Can you hear me better now? Student, I think uh, you are okay. on internet problem. Please correct you. Are My bad, internet. sorry. Okay, now it's clear. I'll keep, I'll keep, it, I'll keep it close to my mouth. Um, Thank you. But what I meant, to, basically what I, was, what I meant to say is the pelvis, the organs in the very open um, none of them are really protected the ovaries are just hanging there 
the fallopian tubes with their fimbri is also just hanging there. Everything is just quite open. So if an infection is spreading from down here and it goes up and isn't treated in time, it spreads very evenly to the lower pelvic um, area. So like we said about earlier, uh, so the most common causes of untreated sexually transmitted diseases, uh, most commonly chlamydia, gonorrhea. Uh, now we're seeing a lot of mycoplasma as well. Oh, sorry, my bad. Uh, if someone, if a woman has, so someone earlier mentioned for um, vaginal hygiene, so you can get bacterial vaginosis. Who, can someone explain to me what bacterial vaginosis is? We can just type, type it or you can um, raise your hand to whichever one. What's bacterial vaginosis? And how does it happen? Anybody? Okay, so in your, everywhere on your body, you have bacteria that's sitting there. So even on our skin, we have bacteria sitting there. We have some stuff aureus. We have, um, in our mouth, we have bacteria that's in there. In our uh, gut, in our bowels, we have bacteria that's in there that helps with digestion. And it's the exact same thing in the vagina. So the vagina has its own set of what we call flora. It's microbiome, it's flora that's sitting there. And that's just a normal bacteria. So the vagina is a self-cleaning organ. Um, it just it will stabilize itself and it will get rid of so the normal physiological discharge, that's just the body just self-cleaning itself. What happens in some women is that if you overclean the area, so if you um if you um clean it a lot with soap or if you use a lot of what we call do things, so people put that the sour head by the vagina to try and clean out the area. So if you overclean it, what happens is you get a disruption in that normal bacterial flora. So you kill off a lot of the good bacteria, and then you get an overgrowth of other bacteria, such as uh, lactobacillus um, and all of that. And then it can cause what we call that bacterial vaginosis. So bacterial vaginosis, it's not, a, um, it's not contagious. It's not something that you can spread around. Uh, but it's basically just an imbalance between the good and the bad bacteria. And the way you would treat it is usually with some antibiotics. Um, avoid people to stop douching, stop using anything in the, their vaginal region, just to use water and nothing else, um, and eat lots of sort of probiotic food. And you're right um, that the symptom is mainly, it has a very fishy odor to it. It has very sort of green discharge, quite purulent and people are having to change their underwear quite often. So bacterial vaginosis in itself, it won't lead to um, pelvic inflammatory disease. But because you have an imbalance and because the vagina is inflamed, that can help the spread of STIs, so sexually transmitted infections from going further quicker into the uterus and into the um, into causing pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, so risk factors, usually it tends to be women who are um, younger, women who don't have access to um, contraception, such as condoms, or people who have multiple sex partners. So as someone said, as uh, Nazma said earlier, so main symptoms. So because it starts off with a sexually transmitted infection, you would start off with symptoms of a sexually transmitted infection. The symptoms from an STI usually is just a bit of discharge. Um, some women can complain of a bit of pain when putting urine or um, can complain of a bit of pain during intercourse and just increase pain in the hemi. Uh, I can't even remove the headset, sorry. My bad. I, I don't even know how to remove it. Is 
is it a lot of people that can't hear me okay? Give me one second. Can you hear me better now? Can you hear me better now? Yes, better. Okay, let me let me not use the headset. Let me try sharing my screen again. Okay, so I'm not sure how much everyone heard, but let's just go back a little bit. Did you, everyone hear about the bacterial vaginosis? What bacterial vaginosis is? We can quickly go back on it again. Um, okay, so it seems everyone heard. Fine. Okay, um, so let's go back to symptoms. So main symptoms, because it starts with a sexually transmitted infection your symptoms would be those of a sexually transmitted infection. So usually that tends to be increased discharge. Sometimes some women get a change in their um, menstrual bleeding. So they'll get a bit of spotting in between their periods or their periods is a bit longer. The bleeding is a bit um, more, more than usual. Um, some women can get a bit of pain when passing urine or pain during sexual intercourse. But what's really important to know is that a lot, a lot of patients are completely asymptomatic. So they won't have symptoms initially when they have the, the STI, so the sexually transmitted illness. That's why it's really, really important that when we do find one patient who has it, so if we, if we treat one um, woman who has it, it's very likely that her partner is asymptomatic and doesn't have any symptoms. And because he is asymptomatic, he might then be spreading it to other women or other men. Um, so what you want to do is you want to treat it as soon as you find it and also contact Trace. So trace all their contacts if they give you permission and treat all those people around, um, around that woman. Main generalized symptoms of pelvic inflammatory disease. So once the STI that's not been treated worsens, then it gets a bit more, your pains, your, your symptoms get a bit more obvious. So people come in with just generalized lower abdominal pain. They're not really quite able to explain it. Increase cervical discharge, increase uh, vaginal discharge, sorry. Um, fever, that can be quite rare. It tends to be more of an, um, fever only presents in sort of very unwell patients and abnormal, abnormal uterine bleeding as well. And we talked about this earlier, but Basically, the way you have to think about it is when you have an infection that's in the vagina, it goes up to the cervix. So it causes an infection and an inflammation of the cervix. So that's cervicitis. When it causes cervicitis, so when something is inflamed, um, it's very what we call friable. And what we mean by friable is that it's very fragile. As soon as it's touched, it bleeds. Um, it's very painful. It's just not a, it's not a healthy tissue anymore. Uh, so the cervix becomes friable, it bleeds very easily, has lots of discharge. And the common presenting complaint is then what we call dyspareunia. And dyspareunia basically means pain during sexual intercourse. If the infection goes further up, so from the cervix, it goes into the endometrium. And if it goes in the endometrium, then we call it endometritis. And endometritis is um, infection and inflammation of that lining of the uterus that can cause a bit of period pain. So women just having period pains throughout the month, that's not linked to that period and having very irregular bleeding throughout the month as well. So if it further continues, um, so if you remember the image we looked at earlier, if it further continues from the endometrium, it goes into the fallopian tubes. It can go one side or bilaterally. And that's when we now call it salpingitis. At this point, usually they, they, they're quite in a bit of pain with it, um, but um, can be very vague and can present very differently in different women. What we worry about though with pelvic inflammatory disease is the complications that we can get from it. So we'll do that a bit later, but let's just talk about diagnosis first. The way you diagnose it is you need to any diagnosis you do in, in medicine, you take a history, you examine, uh, and then you investigate. 
exactly the same thing goes here. So if a woman comes in with uh, lower abdominal pain, change in vaginal discharge, or um, a bit of a bleeding that's not normal for her, and they're in that age group where they might be um, prone to having STIs or they lead a lifestyle that might make them more uh, prone to STIs, that increases your suspicions of PID in that patient. You then want to examine them. So when you examine them, you palpate their, their abdomen. What you want to rule out is any other causes of um, abdominal pain in a 30-year-old woman. So a 30-year-old woman comes in and says, I have lower abdominal pain for about a week. What, what other things are you thinking of in your head? What other things should you be ruling out? So what else can cause lower abdominal pain in a 30-year-old woman? A UTI, yep, yeah, correct. GI problems, yep. Yeah. Just coming back to your GI problems, what's the most, um, I don't want to say common, but what's, so let's go to the GI problems really quick. What's the one thing that you want to make sure it's not? Ectopic pregnancy, yep, correct. We'll come back to that one in a little bit. UTI is good. Come back to the GI problems. What's one GI thing that you want to think, you want to make sure it's not that GI related before you, anyone? So diverticulum is a good one, but it tends to be in older patients. You don't really see 30 year old to present with diverticulitis as often, but correct, it's appendicitis. So a 30 year old comes in with low abdominal pain, things you want to rule out would be ectopic pregnancy, um, appendicitis, and those two things, if you miss, so if you miss an ectopic pregnancy, then you fail, you very much failed that patient. That patient has a high risk of dying when you send them home. Um, appendicitis, you've probably not failed as much, but it's still something you want to keep at the back of your mind. It's something because things can go wrong quite quickly with an ectopic pregnancy, so it can rupture. And with appendicitis as well, you can get a rupture, rupture of the appendix. So you have to think of what's the most urgent things you have to rule out. And the most urgent things you have to rule out in a first year old with low abdominal pain would be um, appendicitis and ectopic pregnancy. The other things that you've all mentioned, so UTI and fibroids and all that, that's all very good. But what you want to, um, a fibroid, if you, if you don't diagnose a fibroid now, she's not going to die. Correct. And ovarian torsion is, is a good one as well. Ovar so ovarian torsion, they usually present very, very unwell. Um, they're in a lot of pain. And usually when you palpate their abdomen, they're, they're guarding. There's a lot of peritonism because they just don't let you touch them as well. But that's correct as well. So I forgot about ovarian torsion. That's a good one. So coming back to our lady now. So we've examined her abdomen. We are pretty sure it's not appendicitis. We've done a pregnancy test and the pregnancy test is negative. So that tells us it's not a, an ectopic pregnancy. Um, and if we're thinking this is a pelvic inflammatory disease scenario, we need to examine her further. So um, what we then do is we do an internal examination and we do a speculum. What do, what do I mean by internal examination and by a speculum? To take a swab. Yep. But before we even do the swab, so what's the internal examination? Does anyone know what I mean? So when you examine the, so an internal examination, like the word says, it's internal. So what you do is you get the patient to lie down. So it's the picture on the left. You get them to lie down. You get them to bring their ankles as close to their bum as possible and let their um, knees fall to the side. And then very, very gently, you insert two gloved fingers into the vagina and you use the other hand to feel the abdomen. So like that picture shows, there's two fingers that goes to the, into the vagina to feel the cervix. Once you feel the cervix, 
you can check for what we call cervical excitation. So you move it, you move the cervix. If that causes them pain, then that's what we call, it's, a, it's positive for cervical excitation. So it's, a, it's tender when you're moving it. In someone who's healthy and who doesn't have any problems with their pelvis, you can do that and it won't cause any pain. It's not going to be comfortable, but it won't cause any pain. And that's, that, so the internal one is the one I'm describing. This one is the bimanual examination, correct? And with your other hand, what you want to do is firstly feel on the uterus. So you feel quite centrally whilst you're pressing with the cervix. Um, and then you want to feel on the side. So where the ovaries would be on the left and the right, you feel that with your um, other hand that's not in the vagina. And what you want to see is, is there anything that's causing pain specifically linked to the reproductive system? And the way you would then document that would be, is there cervical excitation? Is there uterine tenderness? And is there adnexal ten tenderness? Adnexa just means anything that's on the sides, anything that's on the periphery. In this case, what we mean by adnexa is ovaries. Is there any ovarian tenderness when you're sort of palpate doing a bimanual examination. So when you're, you have two fingers touching the cervix and when your other hand is palpating the ovaries on each side, is there any tenderness? Um, and then at that point, you can do some swabs. Um, it depends where you are and see what's available, but usually gold standard at the moment is nucleic acid amplification test, and that's to test for gonorrhea and chlamydia. If that's not available, then you just send for cultures. Um, and the way a speculum is done is you use, that's the image on the right, you use the speculum here. You very gently insert it into the vagina. Once you've inserted it, you open it. Once you open it, you can see the cervix. And once you can see the cervix, you do your swabs um, and send that off to the lab. What it also allows you to do is to look at the cervix. Is, is the cervix healthy? Is there any obvious need on the cervix? Is there any signs of any growth on the cervix and um, so it gives you a really good view of the cervix but nothing else so you don't see anything else on top um, okay and then like we talked about earlier so any sort of woman that's sexually active comes in with lower abdominal pain make sure to do a pregnancy test because um you, you need to be thinking of something like ectopic pregnancy and other things to consider would be something like appendicitis and uh, ovarian torsion, like we talked about earlier. So if we presented with appendicitis, what would, um, how would they present with appendicitis? Sorry, can you repeat your question, ma'am? So if someone has appendicitis, how will they, how will they, what symptoms will they come in with? Correct, yeah. So the appendix in 99% of People, it sits in the right iliac fossa of the ab abdomen. Um, and you have two peaks, so it mostly tends to be a pediatric case, or some people can get it a bit later in life. But it doesn't mean that if you're in between that you, you won't get it. It's just your chances are a bit lower. And usually it presents, so generalized abdominal pain first, usually around the umbilicus, and then it goes to. Um, over a few days, over a few hours, it will then radiate very specifically to the right iliac fossa. So it tends to be just a pain on the right side. Um, and then you, um, because there is an inflammation of the appendix, most people don't want to eat, their appetite goes off because the GI, the, the GI tract is inflamed, so it doesn't want food in it. So the, the appetite goes off, have diarrhea, um, can have symptoms of infection, so things like a fever and all of that. Um, when you examine, what you want to be looking for is what we call McBurney's point. So McBurney's point is between the anterior, um, the ACEs 
on the right side and the umbilical point, it's two thirds of the way in between. And when you press on that, if that's tender, then that's Mac, um, that's positive for Mac, Mac Bernie's, um test. Um, you can also do other tests like rebound tenderness and you can check on the other side as well, but that's for something else. But that, that's the way that would usually present. And something like ovarian torsion, how would that present? So ovarian torsion, like the word says, torsion is when the ovary is twisting on itself. So if you guys remember, if you look at the image from before, the ovary is just hanging on by ligaments. It's just hanging on by ligaments. And when it's torsioning, it's when it's twisting in on itself. So when it twists on itself, you get the blood supply to the ovary is affected. And that's it it's causing an ischemia to the ovary and it's very, very severe abdominal pain, usually very unwell with it. So nausea, vomiting, fevers, very, very tender on abdominal palpation. Um, so anyone who's in that much pain needs to have an ovarian torsion ruled out before anything else. Uh, so complications of PID. So the reason we, are, we want to treat um, pelvic inflammatory disease is because the complications that you can get from it can be quite long lasting. So as in any infection, if the infection goes and it's not treated, in the fallopian tube, you can get abscesses. So you can get a, um, an abscess that forms there. Or what we also worry about is when you get a lot of infection, the body tries to repair it. And in trying to repair it, you get a lot of adhesions. And the adhesions can then um, decrease fertility. So you can get an increased risk of ectopic pregnancies because you have lots of adhesions everywhere. So the implantation doesn't happen where it should happen. Um, and, or there's just less place for implantation to happen. So your fertil people's fertility can, be, um, can decrease quite a bit. So in terms of abscesses, about 15% of women will have an abscess. There's also something called the hydrosalpinx, which is a picture I've inserted here. And that's basically just a bit of an obstruction, um, but it's just a lot of fluid in the fallopian tube uh, because of all that inflammation that's happening in there. And um, lots of scarring, adhesions, and therefore um, decreasing fertility over the next several years. The other rare complication you need to be aware of is called Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. It's very rare, but it's basically because everything is quite open in the pelvis, so all the organs are quite open. In some, in some women, very, very rarely, if it's not treated, it can spread up to the liver. So you can get what we call perihepatitis, which is inflammation of the liver, um, of the surroundings around the liver you can end up with a lot of adhesions um, in the liver area. It's quite rare and it's a very, um, let me just read the messages, sorry. Uh, it's quite rare, so it's not something that you'll think about if someone comes in, but if someone comes in with very severe right upper quad pain and has change in vaginal discharge or cervical excitation or has a diagnosis of um, pelvic inflammatory disease, it might be worth thinking about, um, about this. So treatment. For the way I think about things is, um, does this patient need to be admitted or can this patient be treated at home in the community with medication? If, someone, if a 30 year old comes in with low abdominal pain, you will only admit if you suspect there might be an ectopic pregnancy. So if their pregnancy test is positive and they have abdominal pain, they definitely need to be seen by the gynecologist to have a scan to make sure there is no ectopic pregnancy. If their signs, um, if their symptoms are very, very severe or not responding to oral antibiotics, or um, they have what you suspect would be an abscess. And usually if you think they might have an abscess, you would feel it on um, your bimanual examination. So you would feel it and it would also be very, very tender on that side. 
Um, but if you think you don't need to admit them and you can treat them at home, then you just make sure that you're taking swabs first, because if you start treatment before you're taking the swabs, then that's likely going to um, alter your swabs. But if you think a patient has PID, you should start antibiotics as soon as possible to decrease the chances of those complications. Antibiotic treatment changes every few years because um, the, the sensitivities of gonorrhea keeps changing. And this very much depends on where you are in the world. For example, um, here in the UK, I think it's, it's changed about five years ago because the sensitivities to gonorrhea changed. Um, so wherever you're working, I would just follow the guidelines of wherever you're working to, to give antibiotics, but it's usually about two weeks course of it. So it's a long course of two antibiotics to make sure that you've cleared it completely. Some women will have a copper coil or will have a Mirena coil inside of their uterus for contraception purposes. You don't need to remove it initially, but if symptoms have not improved, then it's likely not helping with the infection and you should remove it just to help the body clear out any infection that it has. And that's it. I told you guys it wasn't very long. Any questions at all? Sorry, I know I rushed through it a little bit. Um, any questions at all? Thank you, Dr. Najma. Um, I'll be um, as moderator in the last few okay. minutes. So it was an amazing lecture. If uh, anybody has any question, they can raise their hand and they can ask their questions. If anybody has a question. Or you can even just um, type it if you want. Sorry. I so we are waiting. Yes, Farida, go on. So and there are uh, some uh, questions in chat box. I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, no, you're okay, don't worry. So in terms of antibiotics, what I tend to do is oral ofloxacin and metronidazole. So the 400 milligrams twice a day for 14 days. But first line would actually be um, keftriaxone that you give intramuscularly as one dose. And then you give doxycycline and metrodinosaur for two weeks. But again, this very much depends on where you are in, in the world. Um, like somewhere like Australia will do it completely differently because the sensitivities to gonorrhea and chlamydia would be different there based on their um, antibiotic use. So if you're pregnant, then you would do, you can do azithromycin. Um, if you're pregnant, you do azithromycin and metronidazole, but it has less of a, um, azithromycin is just not as good for uh, PID. So we tend to try not to use it as much as possible, but you're right. Yeah. Pregnant women, azithromycin, metronidazole. Farida? So there is a First, Farida, yes. Farida, you can ask your question. Farida, are you there? I think it's okay, she might not be. It might be a mistake. No, uh, I have a question. Mm hmm. I can't yes, hear you anymore. I heard you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question between treatment of uh, inpatient or out, outpatient treatment. Yeah. So, what would differentiate this? If, if, if they are very severely unwell and you're admitting them, um, you would start off with IV antibiotics. So you would get the, IV, the antibiotics through the IV line. Most of the time that's enough. You can just do IV antibiotics for about 48 hours just to get the infection under control, give them IV fluids just to rehydrate them and then um, send them home with, to finish their course orally for two weeks. 
But if they're not responding to the IV antibiotics, then you should have a suspicion for, is there an abscess? Is that why the antibiotics isn't enough? At that point, the gynecologist will decide about potentially doing the laparoscopy to see if there is any uh, abscesses to have it cleared out. But usually when you're admitting them, it's just for IV fluids, IV um, antibiotics, see how they respond. If they respond well, send them home with oral. If they don't respond well, then to consider a laparoscopy to see if there is any abscess or anything like that. Is that okay? Oh, that's very that get her question answered. So if there is anyone, yeah, here is Najma. Najma, you can ask your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Najma, for amazing uh, lectures. My question is that, uh, as you mentioned, one of the complications of the pelvic inflammatory disease is tube ovarian abscess. If a patient has a P and also TUA and um, her TUA is ruptured, on that time, again, you can use uh, antibiotic medication or not. That's one question. And um, other one is uh, uh, when a uh, uh, patient they have a pelvic inflammatory disease and also uh, she has or he has, uh, she has a hypertension and tachycardia. On that time, also, we have antibiotic therapy, use it for uh, medication use for uh, her or not or other choice we have that for. Okay. Um, can you just repeat your first question again? My first question, uh, one of, uh, as you mentioned, one of complications of pelvic inflammatory disease is tube ovarian abscess. If a patient has tube ovarian abscess ruptured, on that time, this medication, antibiotic medication, as you mentioned, we can this use or not? So that's a really good question. So if they have an abscess that has ruptured, they will be a lot more unwell than if they just have an abscess. So once the abscess ruptures, you get what we call peritonism. So they're going to be very peritonitic. So there's a, going to be a lot of guarding of the abdomen. You're not going to be able to touch it. And because it's ruptured, that infection is going to spread around the abdomen. They will be quite unwell with it. They'll probably be septic with it. So like you said, tachycardia, hypotension, and all of that. What you want to do is take them into hospital. Once you take them, anyone who comes into hospital is tachycardic and is hypotensive. You want to try and stabilize them first. So you give them lots of IV fluid, give them one liter bolus to see how they respond to it. Give them some IV antibiotics straight away to see how they respond to it. But they are going to so that might help a little bit with the hypertension. It might help a little bit with the tachycardia, but it's not going to help with the peritonism because you still are going to have that massive infection overload in the pelvis. They're going to need to go into surgery firstly, because if the, if the abscess has ruptured, there might be a lot of bleeding that's happening. There might be a lot of, um, of pus around there. So they'll need to have, um, surgery immediately to have a look at a laparoscopy to see what's happening um, and see how best to treat it. And your second question was to do with hypotension and tachycardia and if we would treat them the same way. So it's exactly the same thing again. So if they are coming in hypotensive tachycardic, that already tells you that the infection is quite severe, that they're not coping very well with the infection. Again, lots of IV fluid bolus, IV antibiotics bolus. Uh, give them, see how, how they respond to that. Re-examine at that point. Re-examine the abdomen, see how it is. Is it getting better? Is there peritonism? Is there a mass that you can feel? Can you feel an abscess? If you can feel an abscess at this point, then you take them into surgery. If you can't feel an abscess and actually everything's improving, then you could just keep them on antibiotics and see how that happens. So it is very much, um, there isn't one right answer for everything. And every gynecologist that you meet will do things a little bit differently. Um, in my experience, they tend to, to wait as much as possible before taking people into surgeries. They don't like doing emergency surgeries on things like this. Um, so they will try lots of IV fluids, lots of IV antibiotics and to see how they're responding. If they're still hypertensive, they're still tachycardic, you're going to want to get them into surgery a lot quicker at that point. Okay, thank you, Meda. No problem. So just a few questions on there. So um, 
Yes, there is another person, Samsung. You can ask your question. Your voice is not clear. Excuse me, uh, your voice is not Are you listening? No. Are you listening? Do you want to talk it out? We can't hear you very well. We can hear. Uh, uh, can you uh, change your I location? Is it okay now? It's a bit better. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Let me ask my question. The uh, question was, uh, I saw a patient before. Uh, we suspect that uh, she is with the ID, and uh, we uh, have uh, the, the winning culture, the um, battle of the start was the uh, uh, grandfather of me, and uh, it was a victim with every identity. Uh, uh, Sorry, I can't hear you very well at all. Are you able to type it out? It. So, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, it's We cannot hear you. Can you type in the chat box? Can you type it out? Chat box, if that's okay. Please. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's a lot better. Yep, a lot better. Go on. Start again. Yeah, no, but that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think. Um, we have culture, we had a culture uh, from vaginal discharge from one patient and uh, the result was gram positive coxy, the strain organism, and uh, it was resistant with every antibiotic except septron, mm -hmm. uh, I mean cotrimoxazole, amipenium and linozolate. Now, what's your opinion? Uh, if we started these, uh, one of these antibiotics, it would be um, 40 days or seven days? I would still do 40. Do you clinically, do you think the patient had, so you can't base, so the swab can direct you on what antibiotic you would do. But if you think the swab was positive just for an STI, so um, just gonorrhea, but hadn't infected the pelvis yet, then I would just do seven days. But if you think they had clinical symptoms that showed PID, so that the infection had worsened and had gone into the pelvis, then I would definitely do 14 days. Does that make sense? Okay, and uh, with this antibiotic, uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can add metronidazole or dexacycline or not. Only one antibiotic, and that's, uh, for example, cotrimoxazole or linozolate is enough for patient. Well, if it's sensitive to it, then the one should be enough, if it's sensitive to it. The reason we here in the UK we do two antibiotics is because firstly resistance and also because we treat before we get the culture back. So we treat before we get any, any sensitivities back. So we treat with two then because of that. Um, if you had a swab that showed it was sensitive to one antibiotic, then the one I think should be enough for 14 days. And then you can just re-swab afterwards as well and see if there's anything that comes back um, and if it's just gone completely. But I think the one would be would probably be enough and I'd probably do it for 14 days. Okay, it's diffi it's difficult, so because especially when they're so resistant and it's, it's difficult. I don't think there's a uh, right or really wrong answer. When I mm -hmm. see the ripples, and uh, it was resistant with every antibiotic. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't think there's a wrong or a right answer. You just sort of do what, what did you do at that point? Um, in my opinion, I, um, I when I saw a patient, so I used cotrimoxazole plus metronidazole, uh, 500 mm -hmm. milligram twice daily for 14 mm -hmm. days. After that, the patient's situation yeah. was really great. But the uh, one thing, yeah. uh, I, I'm still dealing with the cervix erosion. I don't know. What's your opinion for that? Even with antibiotic, it doesn't get better. 
Uh, well, we, we know that it can be quite difficult to treat and if it's not getting better. Yeah. So, is, did you say cervix erosion? Yes, yes. Could it just be that the erosion will heal over a certain amount of time and you need to watch it? Or could this be precancerous, the cervix erosion? And is it something that, is it? It doesn't seem like a pre-cancer situation, no. uh, mm -hmm. but the patient has uh, bleeding after in the course. So mm. and, um, she wants to get pregnant soon. And uh, mm. what she wants is just, just treat that. I want to get pregnant soon. And uh, even with antibiotic, and, um, I, I just didn't get the good result. Did, did, did you repeat the swab after your two course of antibiotics, after your two antibiotics? Actually not, because the patient's situation mm. was really great after that. Um, she yeah. doesn't have any pain. Uh, everything was gone, yeah. so... Yeah, yeah probably. Um, I think probably the cervix erosion is just, it's damage, so it will take time to heal to itself. But it's still something I'd probably want to keep an eye on, so probably see them again in about a month's time just to re-look at it, make sure that it's getting better and it's not getting worse. Because with any erosions, I would expect uh, it will okay. take time. Uh, what's sure. your... Yeah. Uh, what's your opinion about the tampon that uh, some doctors use? For example, they use uh, zinc oxide uh, ointment plus mm. um, estradiol yeah. uh, uh, yeah. injections and they take tampons for four to five days. Um, is it yeah. good or not? Yeah. So it's what, here we use that a lot for ectropians. So when you have an ectropian, it's basically what an ectropian is is if I show you the image of the yeah. cervix. So if you look at this, can you see my mouse moving? Can you see my mouse now? Yes, yes, yes okay, right so now I can see so, that. So this bit here is the cervix, right? This bit here. This bit is the, I can't remember the exact names anymore. But this bit is yeah. the outer layer, and this bit is the inner layer. What an ectropion is, is just that this inner bit has come out. Um, and that's what you can see as the ectropion. That's the redness that you can see. That's the, um, that's the, that's the bit that bleeds after intercourse, because it's just a, a lot more gentle of a tissue. It's more sensitive. It's more fragile, so it tends to bleed. Um, so then what you do with what we call cauterization, so that's like you said, the zinc oxide and everything, it's just to stop that vessel from bleeding. And in itself, ectropians are completely harmless. So it wouldn't even affect your chances of fertility or anything like that. It doesn't change that. It just, um, it's done very, very often, um, cauterization. And I think it's usually women get really good um, response from it, increased quality of like their bleeding stops. They stop getting all that bleeding after intercourse and all of that. Okay, okay. Great. Thank you, thank you so Najma. much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Najma. Could you please uh, stop the recording? I wasn't the one who recorded. I think it was started by um, Dr. Wahid. So I don't know so, how to... I'm only sharing. I'm not recording. So stop. I can also stop sharing. Not it is also out of my hand. I cannot stop stop that. Just a few more. So a few more questions. Someone asked a difference between STD and STI. They're exactly the same thing. So STD just means sexually transmitted disease. STI means sexually transmitted infection. They mean the same thing. Um, someone said the syndrome that they don't get. I'm guessing that means the Fitz Q Curtis syndrome. So what we mean by syndrome is that there's multiple symptoms happening. In this case, the infection has spread to the liver. So the, multi the different symptoms that they will get will be liver pain, so right upper quadrant pain, and will be symptoms of PID. So um, vaginal, abnormal vaginal discharge, abnormal uterine bleeding, or abnormal um, cervical excitation. 
So thank so, you, Dr. Najma. There's just two more questions. I'll be really quick. Um, okay. Yeah. How about the judge color viscosity amount would show? So it, along, I don't know about different countries. So before people used to use viscosity of the discharge to um, to tell us what infection they might have, but I think now we have a lot better. Um, investigations like cultures and um, amplification tests so we don't really use that anymore but for example the color the amount it can clinically it can guide you to a diagnosis you can have a higher suspicion of something like bacterial vaginosis if it's thick gray green and purulent um, but whereas if they come in and they tell you they have a discharge that's very milky white um, then you think thrush so it can guide you a little bit but I don't think we would clinically look a lot at viscosity and things to guide you to, to things. Can fibroids cause ectopic pregnancies? They can cause, especially if they're very, very big. Um, but more than that, I think things like if anything that's sitting in the uterus can cause an increased risk of ectopic pregnancies. So example, like co couple coils can increase your risk of ectopic pregnancies very, very slightly. Um, and it, it has to be quite big fibroids for it to increase your risk of ectopic pregnancies. But with if the fibroids are that big already, your fertility would already be quite decreased. So if you are if you have massive fibroids, you're probably not going to be as fertile as you would like to be. And treating the fibroids would probably be the way forward. Um, so someone talked about, so we said if she test for ectopic pregnancy for abdominal pain. We had a patient last week, she was pregnant. We tried to test the HCG, but she, it showed negative. How did you test for your HCG? Was it urine or was it um, blood HCG? There's also a Dr. last question. Yes. Oh no, I'm just asking Dr. Uh, Dr. Najma. Yeah. Yes. I think so Dr. she Rosa left. Asked, oh, the oh, did she leave? Okay. Uh, so yeah. there is a, so even urinary pregnancies are actually quite good in 99% of cases. Um, if you think it's negative and you think you have, you're still quite suspicious, I would do a blood HCG. You're, you're with blood HCG, you're very, you're even more sure that if it's negative there, then you're not pregnant. Um, so I usually trust urine HCGs a lot because they're very, very accurate. But if you have a suspicion that it might be worthwhile doing blood HCG. And the pathophysiology of Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome. Um, I don't really know what the pathophysiology is, but from what I've read online, it basically is just that because everything's quite open. So the pelvis is quite open. Everything can reach everywhere. So, um, but it is very, very rare. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend too much time on it. Um, just be aware of it, that it's just because the pelvis is very open, there's nothing protecting anything else. Um, so infection can travel. It's like, an, it's like, um, oh, the word, endometriosis, is that? No, I'm thinking of something else, Never mind. Uh, the word isn't coming to me now anyway. 